happy birthday this week to Casey Soule, Lori Friesner, Nancy Best, Alex Gindy, and Sam Francis. Today, Roger and Gloria Tyslin are celebrating their 68th wedding anniversary. On the 24th, Dave and Pam Grimm will celebrate 46 years. And on the 26th, Jeffrey and Denise Getchell will be celebrating 53 years. Even though we are not meeting together for worship, the work of the church continues. This week, the Mission Committee is sponsoring a Care and Share Drive-In Donation Day in our parking lot on Wednesday, August 26th from 10 to noon and from 4 to 7 p.m. Please drive by to drop off your donations for World Medical Relief, Open Door Outreach Center, or Faith Communities Coalition on Foster Care. See the newsletter or website for more information about the types of items that are needed. Good morning. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Welcome and thank you so much for sharing your morning with us here at Northbrook. I'm sitting outside on the bench looking at the trees and the flowers and I can feel the presence of God. This is a wonderful way to begin our day. This is the day the Lord hath made. Rejoice. Good morning. Please join me for our call to worship. Welcome to the joyous celebration of life in Jesus Christ. We come here gladly as we acknowledge the presence of the Lord, even though we are in separate places this day. Still, we are made one by God's love that is manifested among us through the power of the Holy Spirit. May we be a shining light to the confess our sins by praying the prayer of confession. Creator God, your goodness is shown to us in so many ways. In every age we rediscover your loving care, yet we miss the fullness of your glory as we limit our vision to our own needs and cares, forgetting about you and neglecting those around us. Open us to the power of your grace. Make us receptive to the new life you have poured out upon us. Grant us new strength to work with one another, renewed patience as we learn from one another, and growing wisdom as we seek to minister to one another. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 
Friends, hear the good news. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we learn that God's love has no limits and God's forgiveness has no bounds. In Christ, we are forgiven, freed, and made new once again. Our scripture reading this morning takes us back to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Here Moses reviews with the Hebrew people how they escaped slavery in Egypt, wandered through the wilderness, and finally reached the banks of the Jordan River. As they now prepare to cross over into the Promised Land, they need to be reminded of their history and their faith. On one hand, the book is an excellent historical review. It takes the Israelites' lengthy journey from captivity to freedom and puts it all into the framework of God's great saving acts. It is clear that without the hand of the Lord providing for their deliverance, they would either have been a servant people forever or simply disappeared into the trackless waste of the desert. On the other hand, Moses' words in these chapters is also a reminder of the importance of passing this history and this faith unto all the generations that will someday follow. For a Hebrew, faith and history were intertwined, with the Lord Jehovah being the binding cord around both. So Moses makes it very clear that this history, this tradition, this faith, is to be carefully guarded and accurately transmitted to their children and to their children's children until the end of time. Nowhere is this mandate made more clear than in our passage for today. We read now from Moses' words in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Listen now for the message that God would have us hear for this day in our own lives. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away when you lie down, and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. And write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Love is something that you learn. Do you ever stop to think about that? None of us comes into this world knowing how to love. It's sort of an acquired behavior, a learned behavior. It's a lesson that we pick up in hundreds of thousands of ways through a, a multitude of experiences and unspoken social cues during this very long process that we call growing up. The point is that our ability to love is not something that's automatic. It's not part of some kind of hardwired human harness. It's not something we're programmed with prenatally. It's not a system all ready to start up when we press some go button. No. Rather, there are many, many people in our lives, starting with our parents, who gradually over time teach us what it is to shift from being selfish, taking, grasping little infants into being giving and sharing and caring mature adults. Yeah, it's a process. And it takes a very long time. It takes years and years before you and I finally get it right. 
And there are many people along the way who teach us how to do it right. But the sad thing is, just the, the very opposite is equally as true. Just as we are taught to love, so also we can be taught to hate. And it's this downside that is the subject of my thoughts this morning. Hatred, bigotry, prejudice, these are all learned lessons. None of us is born into this world already knowing how to hate. This, too, is acquired behavior, and this, too, is learned from various role models that we have in life. I'm guessing that many of you will remember the classic musical, South Pacific. First came out in 1949, was later put into a film version in 1958. But in that old musical, there is a, a little song. And it's entitled, You've Got to Be Taught. And it has to do with exactly what we're talking about. The words go like this. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are ugly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you were six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. The biting sarcasm of those lyrics speaks an unavoidable truth. Babies are born without a single prejudicial bone in their little bodies. They do have to be taught. An infant knows nothing about racial differences or ethnic diversities. It knows nothing about economic class distinctions or gender or age bias. Infants indeed have to be taught as they grow older. And unfortunately, there are a multitude of teachers out there just waiting to begin with all those lessons about who to hate and why. Sometimes, tragically, those teachers can be parents or aunts or uncles or grandparents. They can be older brothers and sisters or neighbors down the street. Sometimes those teachers can be teachers or misguided clergy or political leaders or writers, authors, actors, musicians, or anybody else who uses their craft, who uses their trade, who uses their position, who uses their profession to poison the developing hearts and minds of the innocent. It's often been said, a kid is born with a sort of blank slate, and it's the people in that kid's life who are going to write on that slate. They're the ones who are going to give that child ideas and impressions and values, some of which are going to be dreadfully wrong, some of which are going to be long-lasting and very destructive. Out of curiosity this week, I googled significant world hotspots where there are varying degrees of internal turmoil, simmering hatred, or sometimes outright civil war. I found a web page that is updated by the Council on Foreign Relations, and it listed, get this, it listed 26 different locations of turmoil, where hatred toward others is a key ingredient between factions, Dividing people racially, religiously, ethnically, culturally, economically. Now, some of these places are probably a bit familiar to us, like North and South Korea, or the continuing unrest in Afghanistan, or the civil war in Syria, or the continuing factionalism in Iraq, or the hard lines drawn between the Israelis and the Palestinians. 
There are some others relatively unknown to us, such as raging civil wars that are going on right now in places like Libya, Yemen, the Congo, the South Sudan, and Somalia. You know, at their basic level, all of these conflicts are really pretty much the same. All of this hatred, this suspicion, this fear, it all started somewhere. Maybe it was back decades ago over disputed lands or geographic differences or economic disparity. Maybe it was back centuries ago over ethnic differences or language differences or cultural differences or, yeah, religious differences. I once talked with a military officer who had been part of the peacekeeping force that got sent into Bosnia during the civil war that occurred over there in the early 1990s. In that situation, as you might remember, we had the Croats, we had the Serbs, we had the Bosnians, we had the Montenegrins, all of them surrounding themselves with several hundred years of intense hatred based on their differences. There were extreme cultural and ethnic differences all of which were further exacerbated by intense economic and religious differences. Wow, what a perfect backdrop for total hatred and disaster. You see, everybody's different. Everybody's an enemy. And so several hundred thousand people died and almost two million were displaced, losing everything they had. Now, this military officer who had been there as a peacekeeper, finally bringing an end to all of that violence in what was truly a civil war, he said it was the only time in all of his experience when you could walk down a street and you could literally feel the hatred that emanated from all sides toward all the other sides. There was this incomprehensible loathing toward other people, all of it based on ancient traditions of fear or mistrust or hatred. This mutual detesting of, of the other was palpable. It was in the air all around. Children there were taught very early on about how to hate all of their traditional enemies and how to want to kill them if they were ever given the opportunity. And so, like kids raised on a perverse primer in kindergarten, that's exactly what happened. Generation to generation, old to young, parent to child, each newborn citizen was taught to hate an enemy due to some ancient wrong, probably long since forgotten, or simply because those people over there, well, they were different. And you see, that's how it happens, this teaching. You expand it a bit, and you've got something like the Cold War that's lasted for 70 years between the U.S. and Russia. You retune that teaching a little bit, and you've got all those world hotspots that never, ever seem to go away, like North and South Korea. If you shrink that teaching a little bit, you've got the mountain feuds of the Hatfields and the McCoys, or you've got Shakespeare's... Classic families, the Capulets and the Montagues, or closer to home, right here you've got the ugly face of white power racism. And so it goes for generations. The hatred persists, carefully nurtured, simply because somebody somewhere is different. And thus the lesson is taught and learned to be suspicious, cynical, distrusting, defensive, adversarial. In other words, the lesson that's taught is to hate. Now against all of this stands the Church of Jesus Christ. Against all of this stands the gospel message of acceptance and forgiveness. Against all of this stands the message of toleration and diversity the message of oneness, the message of love. The point is that somewhere between the little ones and the older ones, the church tries to make a difference. 
It tries to mold lives in the direction of what we understand to be the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church tries to show those little ones how we understand the gospel compels us to live. The church tries to share with the younger ones the values and the morals that are going to be positive in their lives as we understand those values and morals to be positive in our lives. The church <laughs> tries as best it can to stand now in the shoes of Moses, in a way, who helped his people understand the, the critical role they had to play in sustaining the faith of that nation's children and in giving them some right guidelines by which to live. But folks, this is a very uphill battle, and it seems like the tide is often running against us. We have to somehow counter the attitudes and the ethics of a world that's very secular, a world that's very uncaring, and a world that basically is amoral. Under normal circumstances, before there was a COVID pandemic, the church would be able to interact with its youngest members for maybe one or two hours each week. I want you to think about that for a moment. Under normal circumstances, before the virus, the church, our church, all churches, would be able to interact with its youngest members maybe an hour or two each week. That's less than the total time a typical kid spends in the bathtub each week. So my point is the church needs all of us adults as role models. The church needs all of us to be actively involved in the lives of all young people, whether it's here in the church or at home or in our extended families, in our neighborhoods, in the school system, in the workplace, in the marketplace. You know, you and I, we're all involved in this lifelong process of teaching, even as our children among us and around us are all involved in the lifelong process of learning. That's part of our calling as Christians, to be this, to do this, to combat the negative ethics and the self-centered values of our world, to combat the insidious teaching and modeling of distrust and envy and suspicion and fear and hate and all those other things that you've got to be taught. Amen. And may God's blessing be with you this day and throughout the rest of this week to come. Amen. Prayers of the people, let us pray. Father God, in whose love we live and move, we pray for a world crying out to feel loved, wanted, cherished, and unique. Heavenly Father, source of all love. We pray for a world torn apart by conflict and war, a world that lives uneasily in a climate of fear with no clear vision for future days. Heavenly Father, source of all hope. We pray for a world that thinks less of others than of self, a world where division between nations, race, religion, neighbor, and family leads to distrust. Heavenly Father, source of all peace. We pray for a world that is short on happiness, too busy to enjoy this world you have created, too preoccupied with living to appreciate life. Heavenly Father, source of all joy. We pray for a world when spiritual longing is satisfied by fashionable notions and temporary solutions with no thought of tomorrow. Heavenly Father, source of our salvation. We pray for a world that needs to know your love, your hope, your peace, your joy and salvation. A world that needs to know it is special, unique, and is uniquely loved by Heavenly Father. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, 
into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lead me, guide me. As our time of worship ends, we rejoice in God's goodness, gentleness, love, mercy, and justice. May the Lord enable us through the Holy Spirit to honor our faith through what we think, what we say, and what we do. As God gives us the light, may each of us in our own way seek to be the people of Jesus Christ. <laughs>